But back to my history lesson, because I want to finish this up, because when the king gets thrown out, a new government gets put in its place. And of course, I, I wish we had time to talk about the Articles of Confederation, but we're going to have to jumpstart to the current document that actually is the supreme law of the land, that actually describes how our government operates. What's that document called? The U.S. Constitution. And folks, I want to very quickly outline how I understand the U.S. Constitution is supposed to operate. I will tell you that when you look at this document and really think about it, there are basically two principal actors. The first actor is the most important. In fact, it's the first three words of that document. We the people. We the people. All I have to do is put my hand up to my ear everywhere I go and people say it in unison. And that's because these are powerful words in the United States of America, and they should be. We the people come together in order to create government. You see, when you look at the way this framework operates, or the way it's supposed to operate, we the people are described as being free and sovereign. And again, what does the word sovereign mean? The authority to rule. So there's our self-government. We, the people in the constitutional framework, are claiming the authority to rule. Government, by the way, is not sovereign. In fact, government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. I like how that goes. It's kind of got a ring to it, doesn't it? Let's keep going. We, the people, are free and sovereign because we are described as having rights. Government does not have rights against the people. In fact, government has duties. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's really important to recognize the difference between rights and duties. You see, if I have a right to do something, it means I can do it, and I don't need anybody's permission. And in fact, if I have the right to do something, and anybody or anything, including government, who tries to take that right away from me, it's the government that's illegitimate. I think that's a very important thing to understand. If you have a right, that is a very, very important concept. And likewise, a duty means, if you have a duty, and if there's a governmental duty, it means the government has to do it, even if they don't want to. The interchange between rights and duties is important. And that's because, folks, in this framework, all power resides with the people. You see... The phrase power to the people was not just a Black Panther Party chant, although it was. It was also an American Revolutionary chant. And I actually think that that word, that, that phrase, actually has incredible power. Do you know how the Black Panthers actually began all of their meetings? They would say, power to the people. In fact, that feels so good, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Power, power to, to the people. people. Power to the people. All right, I'm going to say it, then you say it. <laughs> power to the people. Power to the people. Now let's say it together. Power, power to, to the people. people. How does that feel? It feels good, right? You know, part of the reason I do this everywhere I go is because I like to say it. <laughs> but especially, I like to say it with a group of people. I promise you, if you actually do that more and more, if you actually say power to the people and you start to believe it, you will start to feel a change in yourself. It is a very, very magical phrase. All the power is supposed to reside with the people. And I use the Black Panthers as a specific example because this is a group of folks who were being systematically subjected to intentional racist practices, and yet they were claiming their sovereignty. They were saying, all power to the people. They were saying, we've got the power. And that put them in a psychological, emotional, may I say, a spiritual place where they had the wherewithal to actually be able to feed children before school and to provide uh, shoes for children and to create a self-defense mechanism. And who were they defending themselves from? The police themselves, right? I mean, I just want to point out something that, that when I say that uh, the Black Panthers are worthy of like study and understanding what they were doing. I'm quite serious about this. Now, I also think it's, we're, it's worth studying the American revolutionaries because they were doing the same thing. Now, if all power resides with the people, then why, what, what happened? Well, I would say first and foremost we have to understand that even in this framework, a certain amount of power gets delegated to government. How much power would get delegated to government if we've got all the power? Well, we delegate only enough power so that 
government can perform the duties that we have collectively said, actually, that government ought to, to be providing and government ought to be doing. Because we don't want to say that we're all collectively going to come together to decide where every street sign should go or, or how, you know, the sort of micromanage uh, the details of our society. So this idea is very important. And I look at this and I think, this is brilliant, actually. This, the constitutional framework, as I've just described, is absolutely brilliant because it understands that in my private sphere, I have certain rights that are sacrosanct, that I am a sovereign, but that doesn't end there because there's also a public component. There's a recognition that no person is an island. In other words, this concept satisfies my uh, libertarian impulses, and it also satisfies my communitarian impulses. It recognizes that we the people in our private sphere are absolutely sacrosanct, but that public decisions get made collectively. But check it out. No matter what that decision is or how it gets done, no governmental decision can be legitimate if it infringes upon the rights of an individual. Do you see how that works? This is genius. This is absolutely brilliant. We should try that in this country. I think this would work. And I am not even joking, folks. The brilliance of the way this framework operates is something that is brilliant. These are wonderful words. But the problem, of course, is that we have never experienced it in the United States of America. Because before I go one second further waxing poetic about how brilliant the U.S. Constitution is, time out. Somebody tell me what year the Constitution is either drafted in convention or adopted. 1787. Nicely done. 1787 is the Constitutional Convention, and 1789 it is adopted as the supreme law of the land. I put those dates up to ask this question. In 1789, who actually got to be legal, legally a person? Remember, legal person, it means the ability to assert rights. So what human beings could actually be a legal person? White, White, male, White male property owners, right? So let's do it one at a time. You had to be white. If you're not white, literally, you cannot actually be a person. You also have to be a man. So if you don't have a penis, you don't get to be a person. You might be a human, but you don't get to be a person. And you have to be a property owner. And of course, you also have to be 21, and you have to be in the right religion. So here's a, a way to ask that question. What percentage of the adult population, human adult population, living in 1789 in those 13 colonies could actually claim to be legally a person and enjoy uh, the, frame, the beautiful framework? 10%? 20%? 20%? You're not cynical enough. 1%? You're too cynical. <laughs> it's not 1%, it's 5%. Oh, well, yeah. All right, then. At now, most, it's 7%. So another way to say that, of course, is that 93 to 95% of the human beings living on the continent of the United States within those 13 colonies were not legally persons. So another way to say that, of course, is that for all this beautiful rhetoric, and it is beautiful rhetoric for all these beautiful concepts. And they are beautiful concepts. The problem is that it's in its implementation, this founding is a founding violence. It's obviously a founding violence against the indigenous human beings who already lived here and were subject to intentional, deliberate genocide. And that ugly truth also needs to be told. It's also a, the founding of this country is a founding violence against those Africans who were brought at the barrel of a gun or the point of a spear and forced to build this country because this country was built with slave labor. Barack Obama occupies a White House that was built by enslaved human beings. We have to tell that truth. And I want to say, not so that white people uh, can wallow in guilt. I, like, I believe Nelson Mandela got it right. He said, when you are confronted with injustice and you have a hunger for justice, guilt or shame is not helpful. What you need, Mandela said, is a truth and reconciliation process. What you have to do is be willing to tell the truth, even though it may be difficult, not so that you can make somebody ashamed or feel guilty, but so that you can create a path towards creating something just out of injustice. And so as a white person, I'm here to tell you, white people have got to talk about racism in this country. As a man, I'm telling you, men have to talk about sexism in this country. 
We've got to actually be willing to do that in order to create the circumstances to have a truth and reconciliation process. Because it's a founding violence not only against, the founding of this country is a founding violence not only against the indigenous people and not only against Africans, it's also a founding violence against women. Because women couldn't, it's not just that women couldn't vote. I mean, women couldn't own property. Women were property by any reasonable understanding of that word. Women couldn't even enter into contracts because the court said women lacked capacity. They could not make decisions for themselves. They were like children, and men had to make the legal decisions for them. And likewise, the founding of this country is also a founding violence against most of the white men who did not own sufficient property to actually be fully vested legal persons either. Because most of the white men were either indentured servants, which is to say slaves for a time certain, or at best they were second class citizens. So what we're talking about is a founding violence that was inherently racist, sexist, and uh, class oppressive in its original orientation. And so some people might say, all right, Cobb, you got a scathing indictment against the imperialism of this country. You know, you're, you're all bent out of shape, but hey, like it's over now. And I would point out that Howard Zinn actually said one of the lenses through which American history can be understood is as a series of struggles by actual human people to be defined as legal persons with rights under our Constitution. So that, that, that historical lens is actually very valuable, and we should celebrate the fact that those movements have come before us. But for somebody to say that because imperialism is over, or because uh, slavery is over, or that women can get the right to vote, that it's all good, I say, president. or that we have a black president, I say, au contraire, mon frere, <laughs> it ain't all good. Because I think it's also time to reintroduce the idea of the corporation in our framework here. And in order to do so, I'll ask this quick question. Does anybody know what it takes to form a corporation in Texas today? Fifty dollars. Yeah, it's about 50 bucks. You file some paperwork with the Secretary of State, and as long as your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, do you know what the Secretary, and your check clears, you know what the Secretary of State will do? They will rubber stamp a document. You will be issued a charter. And by the way, how long will that charter last? Forever. Forever, as long as you pay your annual filing fee. Oh, and by the way, what can you do with your corporation once you get it? You can do, it's under law, anything that is legally permissible. Some of us say, well, if I'm paying attention, apparently you can do a whole lot of illegal stuff, too. You get away with it. The point I'm making is that these entities that can become the most dominant institutions that the world has ever seen can be created willy-nilly. Uh, you can do almost anything, and they can live forever. And I say that now to go back to 1789 and ask this question. Do you know what it took to form a corporation then? Watch this. You had to get a bill introduced in the lower house of your state government, uh, the House of Representatives, the State House, and it had to pass by a majority. And then that same bill had to go to the State Senate, and it had to pass by a majority, and then the State Governor had to sign it. Does that sound like anything we know of today? A law, right? That's the process to write a law. Has anybody in this crowd lobbied for a law? I have. Anybody else? How hard is it to get a law passed? Yeah. Right. There's a term of art for it. Real damn hard. <laughs> right? I mean, it is incredible. Just the mechanics of getting a law passed is incredibly difficult. And I'm saying that to really underscore that for the first 75 years of this country, the mechanics of even incorporating at all were incredibly difficult. And not only that, not only were the mechanics difficult, but I'm telling you that as you began the process, you had to identify a public need that was not being met by either private business or by action of government. And if you were granted the privilege to incorporate, not the right, because you didn't have a right to uh, the incorporation, but if you were granted the privilege of incorporating, all you could do was satisfy that very specific need that you had met. And if you were ever found to do anything outside of that specific thing, do you know what happened? Termination. Termination. The corporate charter was revoked. Oh, and by the way, how long would your corporate charter last? Five years. Typically five years. Some of them would go seven or ten, but they were all a time certain.